Hi guys. Um, thanks for thank you for being here today. Um, I know there are some practices that are still closed for emergencies and some practices are going back to work today. So I know some of my colleagues couldn't join me today. Um, I'm Dr. Julianne Cook. I've been at Wang Vision since January. Um, I was just getting into the swing of things when the pandemic hit. Um, today I'm going to go over some of the cases that we've had here at Wang Vision and some of the cases that I've had. I'm going to go over what amniotic membranes are and how they are used in ophthalmic settings. I will mainly be focusing on the benefits of sutureless amniotic membranes. First, we're going to do a poll. See if I can pull up the poll. I can't find where the poll is, Nathan. So look up where near you on the browser where you click share screen. Okay. Um, there should be a launch poll button. Polling. Okay. Do that and then just follow through, click the one you'd like, and then go ahead and launch the poll. Okay, perfect. Here's the first question for you guys. All right. Looks like there's a lot of nevers out there, so you guys will get a lot out of this lecture. Shit, copper? What happened? You just ran and jumped onto the door. Julianne, if you can just, yep, mute. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm not sure exactly who that was. <laughs> um, I'm, that wasn't from my screen, that's so strange. Um, okay. Really strange. Here you go. Um, so it looks like 55% of you guys have never used um, amniotic membranes. So um, we'll learn a lot about the next um, in the next um, slide. I've got another question for you guys. Second poll is what corneal issue do you see most in your practice? Looks like a pretty widespread, uh, mainly pterygiums and corneal ulcers. And one more poll before we start. Um, what kind of practice setting are you in? <clears throat> like a lot are in private practice. So um, today I will go over uses for amniotic membranes in private practice and ODMD practices, so that will help. All right. Amniotic membranes use fetal wound healing tissue to help heal the cornea, AKA tapping into the fountain of youth. 
The placentas for the amniotic membranes are obtained from donors. They're obtained from donors, excuse that. <laughs> obtained from donors, winning women undergoing C-sections. The donors are screened mainly for STDs at the time of their placenta donation. Amniotic membranes are comprised of three main components, the epithelium, the basement membrane, the, and the stroma, which has three layers, the inner compact layer, the middle fiber blast layer, and the outermost spongy layer. There are several biomolecules that have beneficial effects within the amniotic membranes. The most important one of these biomolecules are collagens type 1, three, four, and five. They are potent sources of corneal regeneration. The amniotic membrane acts as a biological band-aid. Just like a bandage contact lens, it shields the cornea from eyelid friction, but it works better than a standard bandage contact lens because it facilitates epithelial uh, migration, it reinforces basal cellular adhesion, and encourages epithelial differentiation. The special properties of amniotic membranes are that it decreases inflammation, it decreases scarring risk or risk of scarring, decreases risk of corneal neovascularization, and amniotic membranes are avascular and they lack human leukocyte antigens, which is responsible for graft rejections. When I was just out of school, I worked with a, in an ophthalmology setting with two corneal specialists. Um, one of them was quite a bit older, and we saw I saw a lot of patients with tarsorophies. Um, tarsorophies are great for chronic exposure keratitis or um, uh, persistent epithelial defects. I think nowadays, now that we have things like scleral lenses and amniotic membranes, tarsorophies are less likely to be used. Um, for things such as peripheral, um, uh, sorry, persistent epithelial defects, this is a study that compares the tarsorophy to the amniotic membrane. 30 patients in this study had persistent epithelial defects that were treated with a tarsorophy, and then 30 patients were treated with an amniotic membrane graft. There was a four-week follow-up um, study on this study, and on four-week follow-up, it was found that both treatments worked well. The tarsorophy actually healed the cornea a little bit faster, however, when I think it comes to patient safety, I think it is more important um, that we think about, when it comes to their comfort, I think it's more important that we think about using an amniotic membrane over um, a tarsorophy. And it's something that optometrists can use in their office. Say you had a patient where you removed their foreign body and then the epithelium just isn't healing, that's a good time to use an amniotic membrane. Instead of having to refer to an ophthalmologist for a tarsorophy, you can utilize what you have in the office or what you can order in order to help that cornea heal. Sutureless amniotic membranes are something primary care op optometrists can keep stocked in their office. A lot of primary care offices let's see, do foreign body removals, just like we talked about. So here's an example of the sutureless amniotic membrane. Um, on the right is a Procara lens. Um, it has the same function as the graft, but there's less complications to the sutures. It's easier to insert, and there's better tolerance by the patient. There's two main types of sutureless amniotic membranes. The first is cryopreserved and the second is dehydrated. The cryopreservation process is done by slow freezing the amniotic membrane at negative 80 degrees Celsius. Procara is one of the examples of a cryopreserved membrane. It's stored in a refrigerator and it must be brought up to room temperature. Um, the FDA has approved this for wound healing, anti-inflammatory, and as a protective barrier. 
De dehydrated amniotic membranes can, are preserved with, using a vacuum with low temperature heat and retain devitalized cellular components. They are FDA approved for wound healing. And you store these at room temperature, they are easily stored in the office. Um, rehydration of these lenses consists of dropping a couple of drops of saline on the lens prior to installation. You can also hydrate it with saline um, it, once you put it on the patient's eye before you put the soft contact lens off. And we'll talk about installation in a minute. Or insertion. So there are several different types of sutureless amniotic membranes. There's more than just that are on here, um, but these are just some you can reference if you're thinking about adding to your, this to your dry eye treatment or um, adding these to your office. This is what a Procara lens looks like. Um, these lenses have different thicknesses. They have Procara cl Classic, Procara Thin, which is thinner and more comfortable. They have Procara Thin, or sorry, Procara Clear, which has a six millimeter ring in the center. So that's gonna be more for peripheral corneal disease. And they have Procara Plus, that has an extra layer of uh, cryotech for those really bad corneas. Um, for insertion of the Procara, you want to numb up the patient's eye first, and using forceps, you remove the lens from the packaging. You want to um, rinse it with saline. Um, the Procara, again, must be brought up to room temperature um, prior to doing this. You have the patient look down, insert the ring under their top eyelid, and then have them look up and pull down on a lower eyelid. You want to be wearing gloves while you do this. Um, there are a lot of good YouTube videos that you can find online if you um, want it. There are a lot of doctors out there who have done insertion and removal videos, and they are removed with forceps as well, having the patient look up and then um, taking the forceps and um, grabbing onto that polycarbonate ring and um, sliding it out inferiorly. For insertion of de the dehydrated sutureless amniotic membranes, you'll need a soft contact lens. There are two ways to insert the lens that I've seen. The first way, um, both um, the patients are typically more comfortable with preparacane, um, but the first I've seen is using lid specs. You can hold the eye open while the patient is laying back and then apply the amniotic membrane on top of the eye and smooth it out and put a couple of drops of saline in and then put the bandaged contact lens over it. Um, the second way you can put the amniotic membrane in is have the um, directly put the amniotic membrane on top of the contact lens, smooth it out, and then insert it into the eye like a contact lens. And that's, um, that's typically how we do it in our office. On the horizon are amniotic membrane drops. It's the newest form of amniotic membrane eye care. Studies have not proven that they're more effective than am amniotic membranes, and they definitely don't provide that mechanical barrier between the cornea and the eyelid, but they are currently being used by practitioners in conjunction with amniotic membranes. It, um, it's supposed to give it more of a healing effect, adding on the drops. Um, one study did show that acceleration of wound healing with amniotic membranes compared to autologous serum and preservative-free artificial tears um, showed that, um, yeah. So basically, wounds heal, or if you had a patient with SPK, um, punctate keratitis, and um, you were trying to decide between AM drops or autologous serum or preservative-free artificial tears, then um, AM, amniotic membrane drops might be a good way to go. Um, but the other thing, unfortunately, right now, they're not FDA approved, and um, they're um, a little expensive, uh, I think, it, um, cost is around $200 for the patient. Um, so, and they're not covered by insurance yet. Hey, Julian. Yeah. Um, someone had a question regarding uh, the comfort of it, the Procara lens. They were just curious about um, patient comfort with that. Yeah, so that's actually the slide we have right now, um, patient education. So, um, 
the patients will have blurring of vision um, unless you get the Procara Clear, which has that six millimeter ring for patients to see, um, then they're going to be blurry. It's going to be like looking through a cloudy window. Um, it's usually recommended to do unilaterally, but there are some cases in which we've used bilateral and there is mild discomfort with the Procara um, when they blink and there are things to do for that ring and what I did the last time I used a Procare on a patient I taped the lid um, partially closed because they're going to be putting in eye drops over the amniotic membrane especially if you're treating um, an infection like an ulcer you're going to want to keep the eye partially open in order to for the patient to get the drops in so you can put a little thing of clear tape right on their um, upper eyelid so they can open it partially but not all the way and that helps with patient comfort. Um, the lenses can take over a week to dissolve and you might have to repeat the amniotic membrane if the epithelial defect doesn't heal all the way. Um, both of these things are placed in the office and removed in the office. Um, patients uh, somehow always ask, will I have to take it in and out myself? And it's like, no, please come back. Please um, let us take it out in the office. These are some common indications for use of the um, amniotic membranes. I would say um, the pterygium on there is typically we use the amniotic membrane for post pterygium surgery. Um, so it's not going to help, it might help decrease inflammation of an active pterygium that's not visually significant, but um, typically we use it after um, pterygium removal. Um, and then other corneal disorders associated with limb belt. Um, stem cell deficiency, patients with Sjogren's, um, with severe dry eye, you can use this in conjunction with your other dry eye therapies. Common uses in our office are post-corneal cross-linking, post-pterygium removal, um, post-PTK. Um, we do do epi-off cross-linking in our office. Um, so uh, the Amniotic membrane helps the epithelial cells regenerate and the epithelium regenerate. Uh, on here it says corneal dystrophies. Uh, a lot of the corneal dystrophies I've listed are anterior cor corneal dystro dystrophies. You want to um, do a, like typically, you if it's affecting the vision, you do a PTK first and then put the amniotic membrane on there. But if you've got a patient with punct punctate keratitis, you can do an amniotic membrane and see if that helps. If um, no other drops are working. And then corneal ulcers. Um, and we'll go over um, with corneal ulcers and all of the punctate keratitis things. Um, for documentation reasons, you don't want to use the amniotic membrane first if you have um, if you have punctate keratitis, if you have a corneal ulcer, if you have a like a corneal abrasion, you can use it too, but you don't want to use it primarily for documentation reason and billing purposes. You have to show that it has failed um, the standard of treatment um, prior to um, prior to using the amniotic membrane. Um, so the CPT code is 65778, and the definition is placement of an amniotic membrane on the ocular surface without a graft. If you're in a medical office and work with an ophthalmologist and you're using these post-surgically, you want to make sure to put add a 58 modifier because um, it's part of the planned procedure. So if we're doing cross-linking, we're going to build cross-linking and then add a 50, 58 modifier after that. If you guys have any more questions, just feel free to ask them in the little um, box and then Marianne will, will help ask them. Yeah, so we do have one in the Q&A. How long do you try other therapies before you try an amniotic membrane? You know, it could be different for different practitioners. Um, I had, there's a case we'll go over later where I think it was like three weeks into the corneal ulcer and um, it was um, that 
getting a little bit better, but just not moving that much. And um, the amniotic membrane helped a lot. Um, but I, it probably just depends if you feel like it's really bad, you know, you can bring them back the next day and just go ahead and put it on. Um, but I mean, maybe, a, maybe a week, I think it, yeah, I'd say maybe a week and see if that at least a week in order for insurance, but I think they'll still cover it. Um, there's also a case we used it primarily for a, a chemical burn. So we'll go, we'll go over the, the cases. And I think it just depends on um, how, if you feel like it's going to heal or not. And if the patient has, has a risk of under healing, um, like if they're diabetic or um, you think their cornea is neurotrophic, um, you might want to go ahead and use the amniotic membrane sooner. Okay, and we're into the case examples. So our first case example is a 79-year-old male. His chief complaint is blurry vision in the right eye. It's been going on for three weeks. He's having pain, photophobia, and tearing in the right eye, and he's been using artificial tears two to three times a day with no help. He has a history of dry eye syndrome in both eyes, Dermatoclasis in both eyes and corneal edema in the right eye. He was slow to heal after cataract surgery. Um, he's had a YAG laser in that right eye seven months ago, and he actually had cataract surgery two years prior. His left eye, he's had um, cataract surgery just two months ago. Um, health history, sleep apnea, heart failure, anemia. And then um, our best corrected vision in the right eye is 2050 and the left eye is 2020. Um, you'll see on his manifest refraction, he's got a lot of astigmatism and his best corrected vision is 2050. Um, he's got mild injection in that right eye, two plus stromal edema on the cornea with corneal erosion around the, it, it's actually uh, the LRI site. Yeah, I think later, but. Um, so our impression is that he has corneal edema and really recurrent corneal erosion due to the um, incision site not healing. So um, we decided to put an amniotic membrane in the, um, in the right eye and start on Prolenza once a day, Lodamax twice a day, and Bessie Vans three times a day. And on two-week follow-up, his pain and discomfort has improved. He, his sutureless amniotic membrane was removed in the office. The vision was still 2050, and the corneal edema in the right eye had improved slightly. Um, he was tapered off Lodamax. And he st we stopped for Linza and Besavans and continued artificial tears. One month after the amniotic membrane removal, the patient's pain was better and discomfort was improved. He was still 2040, but um, he had been 2040 prior to this, um, best corrected. Um, and then, <clears throat> so he was pretty happy overall. Um, the corneal edema had improved slightly and the incision had improved. Overall, um, the patient was happier with comfort. And um, also, the, it was interesting, the autorefract showed a diopter reduction in astigmatism. Um, and we will consider a, a repeat AMCL in the future if this happens again. I'm going to do a poll question to keep you guys awake. Okay. Do steroid drops increase or decrease corneal wound healing rate? This is pretty easy. All right, so um, it definitely, steroids definitely decrease corneal wound healing rate. So if you've got an epithelial defect, you don't want to put a steroid on it. Um, that's, it's pretty standard treatment. Um, 
um, yeah, steroids can make that epithelial defect worse. And the next case slide um, will be an example of that. We had one other question in the Q&A that just popped up um, or in the chat. Um, do you have a preference on which preservative free artificial tears you use over the membranes? Not typically. I, I think we've been doing sustain um, preservative free or um, I actually really like the refresh retain that comes in the bottle now. Um, it, it's yeah, it's a refresh retain tears and it comes in a preservative free, but it's in the bottle um, mainly because they don't like to deal with a lot of the, um, the little plastic applicators. And some patients with arthritis though have issues with that bottle. So it just depends on the patient. Um, I would say nothing too milky um, because it is just gonna be milkier over um, the amniotic membrane. But also a lot of times we're using uh, sometimes we use steroids over the amniotic membrane. Sometimes we also use um, really milky antibiotics over the membrane and they just kind of sit there. So um, using something less milky uh, is something I would I'd, um, pretty, pretty much go by. Okay, so our second case, we have a 61-year-old female. She's got extreme pain in the right eye, foreign body sensation, light sensitivity, and a decrease in vision. Um, she was referred to our office for a corneal ulcer, and she was, had been previously treated for punctate keratitis. Um, when she did have punctate keratitis, at first they gave her ciprofloxacin and a bandaged contact lens. Um, and, but then she, when she came into our office, she was using Lodomax three times a day and Lodomax ointment at night and ProLenza once a day um, and artificial tears um, four times a day. So um, she could have, uh, you know, developed an epithelial defect that wasn't healing and then turned into an ulcer. Um, that Lodomax um, could have definitely slowed down the wound healing process and allowed for that infection to come in. Um, also wearing the bandage contact lens with only steroids is a no-go. You want, if you're gonna use a bandage contact lens on a patient, you want to um, have them on antibiotics to prevent infection because we all know we've seen so many um, contact lens related corneal ulcers. This patient's medical history is sleep apnea, GERD, kidney stones, shingles, testosterone therapy, um, and she's taking Zoloft, which can also dry the eyes out. Um, so her best corrected vision is 2040 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. Um, she's got a little bit of astigmatism on refraction. Um, she's got two to three plus injection of the conch on anterior seg. She's got two plus edema with two millimeter epi defect on top of that stromal edema and it's in the mid periphery. So it's not a central ulcer, but it's mid peripheral. And then she's got trace SBK in the left eye. There's no cellar flare in the anterior chamber, so we know um, it's not too deep of an ulcer. So our impression is a corneal ulcer due to non-healing recurrent corneal erosion. A patient, I like to do a loading dose for these kind of um, for these kind of corneas. Um, if it's central in our office, we will culture it. Um, this patient. Um, we, it was kind of mid peripheral and we knew it was from recurrent corneal erosion. So um, I thought we'd go ahead and just treat it with Bessemance and Tobramycin and um, see how it responds. And um, we did a loading dose of Bessemance every 15 minutes for the first two hours and then one drop every hour while awake and then Tobramycin as well every two hours. And then preservative free tears every hour for lubrication. And she was directed to stop Prolenza and Lodomax. Can both of those, um, I mean, mainly the Lodomax can cause that ulcer to get worse. So on um, one week follow up, her cornea was getting worse. Um, her best correct division was now 2070. She still had the epi defect, she was still having pain. 
Um, there's no really improvement. Um, the borders are defined, so there's no feather, feathery edges or anything um, fungal related. Um, I did start around vancomycin because I was concerned about MRSA infection. Um, and then um, she continued on the other two drops as well, and I gave her a ZPEC to help with healing and an antibiotic as well. On the next week follow-up, um, she was stable at 2070. The epithelial defect was larger, but the stromal edema had improved. And um, so I said, let's go ahead and put an amniotic membrane on here because she is still in pain, but um, her stromal edema is a little bit better. And um, um, I continued all of the antibiotics over the um, Procara lens and then continue preservative free tears as well. I lessened the drops a little bit um, because she was, this is the one I did tape her eyelid. So she was having to pull her eyelid just a little bit open. Um, and the eyelids <laughs> when they're taped partially can um, get pretty crusty. I had her use OcuSoft lid scrubs while she was, um, you know, not right after she put the drops in, but when her eyelids would get crusty from all of those drops. And um, I definitely talked to her about frequent eyelid cleaning. Uh, the next week, her vision had improved to 2050. Um, the epithelial defect was still two to three millimeters, but she had no stromal swelling and she had improved dramatically on pain. Um, I removed the lens and she continued on an antibiotics. Here's that epi defect. It looks a a little blurry in the right picture of the right photo. I took this um, with my cell phone in the slit lamp. Um, this patient was seen recently. Um, she, I told her she was going to be on the slide. She was happy about it. Um, she, I've been seeing her through this um, pandemic, so I've been coming in every Monday and um, making sure her cornea gets better. Um, and then the next week, um, we her best corrected vision was 20/30. The epithelial defect was a lot smaller and still there. I went ahead and put another um, amniotic membrane on it. I put a dehydrated one on this time and she was a lot more comfortable. Um, I, um, I felt like I, in the literature, I felt like I've read so many different things, but I feel like um, Procara is better for corneal ulcers. Um, the cryopreserved is better for wound healing with corneal ulcers than um, the dehydrated lens, but um, now it's just a smaller epithelial defect. Um, and then she continued the antibiotics. Um, there was a debate between me and my colleagues, is this cornea neurotrophic? Um, there's a lot of neurotrophic lectures out there that we've been, um, that we've been attending. And I will say, I mean, the number one symptom is that they don't have symptoms when the patient's neurotrophic. Um, and this patient had pain watering and light sensitivity. But at the same time, I was curious. So before I put the amniotic membrane on, I went ahead and did um, a corneal sensitivity testing. Um, I feathered out a cotton tip applicator and had her um, look in different directions in each eye. And she did have proper blink reflex. Um, however, the right eye um, sensitivity seemed decreased compared to the left eye, um, especially inferiorly on her cornea. You know, we're most sensitive or we have the most corneal nerves in the central of our cornea, but um, she was decreased in the right eye compared to the left eye. So there is um, a thing called Oxervate, or that's the brand name um, that is out there right now that helps regenerate corneal sensitivity and it can help um, it can help with those neurotrophic um, corneas and there it can help heal um, corneal ulcers um, I'm not sure if it would help this patient um, because she might be in more pain and she was pretty much in pain this entire time so um, sometimes oxervate can make the patients more in pain. So it's kind of a debate. I might consider um, doing that in the future. Any questions for me about that case? Okay. There's a couple questions. Um, yeah. There's actually three. I was gonna just hold on until the end and collect them so we could answer them all because they're not all pertaining to that case. So oh. is that okay? Yeah, that works. 
next case, we have a 34 year old male. He's got dry eye and irritation. It's long standing. Location is in the left eye more than the right. He was diagnosed with Salzman nodular degeneration about 20 years ago, and he was referred to our office for a PTK. Um, I will say if you end up referring a patient for a PTK, um, you want to start them on eye drops, and this patient might have been on eye drops, but go ahead, and if they're having dryness and irritation, I, for some reason this patient wasn't on drops when he came in. Um, but it's always good to talk to patients about dryness and start them on therapy before you send them out just so we can double down. Um, here's an example of Salzman's nodular degeneration. Um, this patient has a history of sleep apnea. This is our third one in a row with sleep apnea um, and all, all other histories, um, hypertension, hypercholesteremia. Okay. The best corrected vision is 20-20 in the right eye and 20-20 in the left eye. Um, he is myopic with some astigmatism and um, he doesn't have a bad refraction at all, just that dryness and irritation. Um, on slit lamp, we see a superior nodule in the right eye and a nodule superior and inferior. His pressure is 25 and 23, and he's got um, packies of 613, um, and CD is 0.5. Um, this patient is on a glaucoma watch. He does have thick cornea, so that's, pro that's a reason why his pressure can be elevated. Um, so our impression is Salzman nodular dystrophy, left eye more than right. Um, we decided to do a PTK in the left eye with an amniotic membrane following surgery. And then um, we started the patient on preservative free tears three times a day with Zydro twice a day. Here is just a picture of his pentacams uh, of the left eye. And the left slide is prior to surgery and the right slide is after surgery. If you see, there's a lot less irregular cornea astigmatism after um, the surgery. Um, seven day post-op, it's pretty normal for them to have decreased vision, a little bit of haze um, right after removing the amniotic membrane. Um, the cornea is still going to be healing for a good week or so, um, but the best correction vision is a little bit worse. It's 2030. That's still normal. And then um, we had them taper the PRED 6, 4, 2, 1, um, and then continue artificial tears and Zydra. So um, two months post amniotic membrane, his vision is back to 2020. His left eye healed nicely with no haze and no edema, no nodules. Um, you want to make sure to um, counsel constant lubrication for these patients um, because it can come back. So you want to talk about long-term dry eye therapy. This patient actually went on to have a successful PRK a year later and he's out of glasses and happy. Next quiz question. Which chemical agent is worse for the cornea, acidic solution or basic solution? This is a pretty easy one. We should all get it. So it's definitely basic solution that is worse for the eyes. Um, it can cause corneal abrasions and conductible hemorrhages. And I'll show you um, the next slide. We'll talk about a case with um, alkali burn. Case number four, we have a 19-year-old female. She's had bilateral vision loss secondary to a chemical burn. The left eye is worse than the right. She's had a um, splashed alkaline liquid 
in both eyes and she was wearing safety goggles. Um, her eyes are very red, sore, frequently watering, and she notes extreme light sensitivity. Her best corrected vision or pinhole vision is 2070 in the right eye and 2100 in the left. The PACI is pretty thick there, and that's mainly because um, she's got some corneal edema. We'll see on the slit lamp. Slit lamp findings are hemorrhages with lid aversion, bulbar and palpebral hemorrhage, and bulbar chemosis in both eyes. Um, she's got three plus edema in both eyes, corneal haze, central corneal abrasions, and then one plus cell in the anterior chamber. Here are some photos from that chemical burn. These, um, the alkaline burns can be very serious and if not treated right away, um, they can cause permanent damage to the eye. I had a patient who got who had gotten paint thinner in his eyes six months prior and he showed up to my clinic at like four o'clock on a Friday with his daughter and his daughter was concerned about his eye and essentially he had, his eye was opaque, his cornea was opaque, um, but with like parts of his iris showing, it looked like his iris had like fused to his cornea um, and, and then he had band keratopathy on top of that and that eye was pretty much done. So um, you definitely want to treat these right away. So we went ahead um, on this patient and put um, bilateral amniotic membranes on them. Um, right away because we know that's going to help heal the cornea the fastest. Um, the patient was given prednisolone twice a day um, to decrease inflammation, the iritis, homatropine once a day um, for the iritis, to, and then um, Bessie Vans four times a day, Brom Day once a day for pain, and then for healing vitamin C, um, and then artificial tears preservative free every hour, and autologous serum was ordered for the patient, and then doxycycline by mouth to also help with healing. On two week follow up, the patient's vision was best corrected 2030 in the right eye and 2060 in the left eye. Um, slit lamp examination showed less, exam or less injection and haze in both eyes, and um, she had a decrease in corneal abrasions in both eyes. Um, the plan was to replace the amniotic membranes in both eyes and continue current medications, and then she was followed up in two weeks. Um, her current status, she ended up having to have two amniotic membranes in the right eye, and the right eye healed to 2020, uncorrected, and she had to have four amniotic membranes in the left eye, and the the left eye ended up scarring over and she had underwent a PTK and a dog in the left eye. And um, unfortunately, the amniotic membrane was not able to prevent scarring in the left eye uh, and the right eye recovered completely. So our next case is a 62-year-old male with redness in the corner of his left eye and with irritation and foreign body sensation. He was referred to our clinic for a pterygium removal. He has glaucoma and he's being managed by another doctor um, with Timolol twice a day and he's not using any lubricating drops at this time. Again, if you refer um, for a pterygium removal, it is important to discuss lubrication drops or dry eye drops um, with the patient. Um, it just helps them get on that dry eye therapy. It helps us double down on um, what we need to do to prevent um, pterygium um, inflammation. But the patients could be on drops, honestly. They probably are they were told to get drops and they didn't end up getting them. That's probably pretty common. Um, he's got a ERM in the right eye and he said strabismus surgery in the left eye. Um, he's got open ankle glaucoma in both eyes. Um, fast corrected vision in the right eye is 2040 with that epiretinal membrane and 2025 or 2020 on manifest. Um, on slit lamp examination, he's got a pterygium that's a four millimeter extension into the left cornea. It's inflamed and visually significant. When we say visually significant, we mean it's, um, it's I mean, it's not blocking the visual axis because the patient's still 20-20, but um, it is inflamed and it's possible that it can grow over the visual axis. Um, and um, it is affecting the cornea anatomy. Um, 
he's got that point ACD ratio and the ERM, but um, in this patient, since he is um, 2040 in the right eye, um, it is important that we remove that pterygium before it gets more inflamed because he, he could lose vision in that eye too. And it's, um, it's interesting that he's exotropic in his left eye, and, but he's not amblyopic. And his, unfortunately, his good eye is that right eye with the epi epirental membrane. So we decided to do um, a pterygium removal surgery on this patient and use a sutureless amniotic membrane after the procedure. Um, you want to discuss the risk of recurrence of the pterygium after surgery. Um, it's important to talk to the patient about wearing sunglasses, staying out of um, the wind, and it's hard for those patients who have these because a lot of them work outside. Um, so making sure they just use lubrication drops regularly, um, whatever um, is in your, uh, whatever you want to use, the stasis, Zydra, Fresh Coach, preservative free artificial tears, just make sure they're on some kind of daily regimen to help prevent, and some wearing sunglasses to help prevent that pterygium to from coming back. Here's a pentacam of his pterygium prior to surgery. Uh, if you look um, nasally, he does have some warpage right there. Here's um, on the left side is the pterygium and on the right side is pterygium after removal. Patient did well after surgery and he had mild irritation, um, but with the amniotic membrane, but other than that, he was pretty happy. Um, normal post-op for us is Lodomax, and right now we use Lodomax SM and then taper um, four, three, two, one with best events three times a day and Prolins it once a day. This patient did have an IOP spike um, after the surgery and I would say, um, you want to avoid a prostaglandin after a surgery like this, I guess for inflammation, dry eye reasons, probably um, adding on Simbrinza or Alphagan to the Timolol might help or, yeah. So just fun fact, amniotic membrane transplantations have been used following the removal of pterygium since the 1940s. Um, and Again, the amniotic membrane transplantation is a safe and effective procedure, but sutureless amniotic membranes can provide a faster, easier, and more comfortable approach um, with the same efficacy. Okay, so suture, in summary, sutureless amniotic membranes can be used in primary care optometrists as well as post-surgical offices. Um, the two different types are cryopreserved, which must be refrigerated, and the dehydrated, which are easily stored just in a um, closet in the office. And then um, common uses are punctate keratitis, recurrent corneal erosion, and persistent epithelial defects. And um, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Cook. I'm going to go ahead and read. There's four questions you have. Um, okay. Do you think there is a difference in um, effectiveness for cryopreserved versus dehydrated amniotic membranes? So I think, I mean, reading it, I do think that the cryopreserve work better on um, corneal ulcers, so they might work a little bit better um, when it comes to wound healing. Um, that being said, um, the, that patient that we talked about with the, ep, with the corneal ulcer, that had epithelial defect, she got better with this, I mean, she's getting better with the second um, dehydrated AMCL2. Um, so if it's a smaller epithelial defect, that dehydrated lens is going to work just as well as the cryopreserved, and the dehydrated ones tend to be less expensive too. Now the next question is, how does use of an amniotic membrane on, on, on an RCE patient after a good, who's had a good outcome after refractive lens exchange or multifocal IOL with minimal refractive error affect the final refractive error or does it affect it at all? So if they have an RCE after uh, yeah. the refractive lens exchange, is it, does it affect the refractive error? 
It should improve the refractive error. On a couple of those cases, the refractive error improved because if you got RCE, you also have some corneal edema and that can change the structure of the cornea. It can add a little bit of astigmatism. So adding the, um, like the first case we saw that patient's astigmatism decreased by a diopter um, just by adding the amniotic membrane on there. So it can help. Um, it's, it's not going to change much, but I think it would improve, the, um, improve it more than hurt it, yeah. especially when it comes to irregular astigmatism. When do you use different amniotic membranes on the same patient or when you do use two different types of amniotic membranes on the same patient, um, can, you charge, can you charge for both or does insurance cover for both? So insurance can cover for both and that patient with a corneal ulcer that I used, I build corneal ulcer for the Procara lens, for the cryopreserved one, and then the second one I build it for chronic corneal erosion. So I did, just to make sure, I wasn't sure, and I'm still not sure if it, it's the same diagnosis, but if you have um, two different diagnoses, like recurrent corneal erosion or persistent epithelial defect, and then I think it'll still, it did cover both of those amniotic membranes. Okay. And another question is, I had a patient with severe dryness and an abrasion who had a bad reaction to the amniotic membrane. Severe inflammation in the cornea, conchoperemia. How do you address this? Are there any contraindications in using the amniotic me membrane? That's interesting. I haven't ever heard of um, anyone having a bad um, issue with the amniotic membrane. Um, I would see if Dr. Rock or maybe Dr. Collins. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that one. Um, <laughs> When we use an amniotic membrane, we typically do use a mild steroid and a mild um, a non steroidal anti inflammatory, which we do find helps with inflammation. And because it is like a foreign body on the cornea, it's not uncommon to have some inflammation like you're describing. But um, if you try to manage it topically, um, as long as there's nothing going on in the cornea below it, um, you know, like, a, like an ulcer, of course, or an infection, then that can help um, to mitigate it. And there are just rare circumstances when the patient may not be able to tolerate the amniotic lens and it may need to be removed pre, uh, prior to planning. Makes sense. Thanks, Dr. Rock. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm just looking through here. Um, Kayla said, I wouldn't even ask. So, uh, oh, Kayla's just got a question regarding prices. Rock, did you see that? So, yeah, so um, we just, it's important for patients with a high deductible plan to know that they may get a bill associated with the amniotic membrane. Um, you know, the charge is kind of significant. Well, it is insurance covered if for patients with high deductibles. We like to let them know prior um, or ask if they've met their deductible, just like any, any medical procedure. All right, that looks like uh, this is, a, I think the person who had the reaction was just clarifying that she did use Lodomax, uh, a Lodomax taper, but um, I think that's yeah. it for the questions. All right. Um, yeah, that is a rare case. And did she use antibiotics too? Uh. Um, I do not, I don't see that, but um, yeah. If, if you have further questions, feel free to um, email or message us privately about that specific case. Thanks, you guys, for attending this lecture, and thanks to Wang Vision Institute for putting it on.